Welcome to Front and Center with Jackie Jordan. Hi, Jackie Jordan. Melissa Joan Hart here. I hear you have a new iHeartRadio podcast, Front and Center. That's awesome. So, you know, here's a toast to all the people making an impact. This is Front and Center with your host, Jackie Jordan. Entertainment and pop culture expert Jackie Jordan is with us. Two-time Emmy-nominated Hollywood producer Jackie Jordan. We are the show where we talk with the change agents, the storytellers, and the activators from behind the scenes, making impacts. And joining me is co-host Phil Barb. With show producer Stephanie Cobian. I think the number is like less than 10% of the employees even know what the values are at a company. Having that amount of self-awareness is half the battle. For me, it's everything's happening right now, all possibilities in different dimensions of time. Hi, I'm Jackie Jordan, and we are the entertainment professionals behind the scenes in life and reality, and we are front and center. So joining me is Stephanie Cobian, our show producer on my right, and then co-host Philip Andrew Barb, two-time Emmy-nominated reality television show producer. We are the series where we introduce you to the storytellers, change agents, and activators who are making an impact and making a difference front and center. I know everybody keeps telling me that's a mouthful, but if you watch the whole sequence, it makes sense. We're kind of getting used to it, right? So if we could change big business, how would we be better for it? And how does that fit into today's show? Well, the reason we're talking about it today is that part of any entertainment business uh, is the actual business of the business. And we haven't spent a whole lot of time talking about the business of the business. It's not show show, it's show business. And uh, as a business owner, as one of the hats that I wear, uh, I feel, you know, I have to operate with a different sense of responsibility and obligation, both to myself, the business itself, and then to the clients and vendors that I represent and I serve. And hopefully, if I'm doing that well, I'm also serving my community well. Don't say I do it perfectly, but it's definitely um, part of our mission statement, our value statement, and our intention to do so. And I believe that... um, I have cultivated proudly uh, a, a series of really impressive business owners in my life to help support what I do for the people that I work for and, and get to serve in my business. So on the show, it, those are going to be the next set of guests. And some of them have a, um, some of our, there happen to be all women, <laughs> the rule of three in one, <laughs> Phil. <laughs> Uh, but they happen to be um, very powerful business owners making a uh, different uh, impact in what they do. Our first guest, Amy Johnson of Amy Johnson Company, was a former film executive who actually went to many film festivals and bought and purchased films. And now she's kind of t- she is really working within uh, personal businesses and entrepreneurial businesses and also taking a look at what corporate structures are doing to make an impact in other values and alignment. And then in our uh, sequence following that, I've got a anomaly because we went to high school together. And I can tell you that our high school stories would be very different than the conversation we're probably going to have today. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, we, we, we reconnected Lisa Mason Butel and I reconnected on uh, social media. She is now a PhD, a doctor, and has had a really um, eclectic career as a uh, leadership Activator is my, my word for it, but has worked in both the um, sports industries and in academia. And she's going to talk about how leadership has actually changed or not changed. And then finally, we're going to end with uh, Monique Evans, who has an intuitive coaching and it's intuitive freedom is the, is the business. But she works one on one with business owners. And I might have her put you on the spot with her about it because she's Right brain as opposed to left brain in what she does, in feeling as, a more, more as opposed to thinking, and can really, and I've worked with her personally, myself as a business owner, because I always say if you want to grow the business, you have to grow the business owner. And in that, she's got a really, uh, she's got a significant gift of moving what I call like blocks and resistance to getting to where you want to be or how you want to be in the world. And intervention. This is basically an intervention. Uh, <laughs> uh, set me right. up. This is going to be an intervention today. All right. That's why we kept you. 
hidden <laughs> on the topic. I get it. Oops. <laughs> so that is like a lot of that is a lot of words. It's a lot of mouthful to say. And I know that what we we have the privilege of doing at TV Guestbert is we do create media opportunities for our clients. But the bigger piece that is the investment piece is how are we growing their businesses? How are we growing their core businesses? And so we've got some really, really fantastic clients who've been with us. And we've got um, one attorney whose law firm does a lot of consumer protection law, law, Abbas Abbas Kazarunian. And he's been helping people like block robocops from their, uh, robocalls from their phones. I followed some of those tips. And? (laughs) It has yeah, lessened. Lessened, exactly. Lessened. Exactly. And he's also been helping, um, Cal- especially California, f- uh, homeowners whose houses have caught on fire and, you know, putting together the, the class action suits and who's not getting their insurance company, you know, insurance paid. And, oh, wow. Yeah, so he's kind of really doing that. And, you know, so again, it's it's about, I always think about how, how are we putting, you know, using media and opportunity to help you know, create and activate change. So that's what our people are doing. And then I'm just really proud of our TV Gespert publishing new book, A Psychiatrist Guide, Stop Teen Addiction Before It Starts with Dr. Guyani De Silva. So we were, the three of us were chit-chatting before the show, like, what is, what are we, <laughs> what are we going to talk about? <laughs> yeah, we're, I'm just saying. <laughs> what are we going to talk about, Jackie? I'm trying to throw a joke in there every now and again. Uh, exactly. So, um, but you brought up a really good point, Phil, in, in the conversation, like, well, what is the point? Or, or is it big business's responsibility to change, change or not change? And that was the question you posed. Yeah, and I think that's the, I think that's where, uh, I think there's a discussion, obviously, to be had. And I think a lot of people don't, I don't think there's one answer you right. know, on where is that line between, you know, a business that is existing, right, purely for the advancement of the society at large. And then the complete opposite end of, will as long as the company is making money, it doesn't matter who gets hurt in the process. And if those are the two wide extremes, like, where do we live? Like where in, in, are those the extremes? Like, is there, do those, is it a timeline that is from point A to point B? Is there, is it, I don't know. No, it's a I great, it's a great question because, um, on our earlier, earlier podcast, we had, uh, Siraj Raval, mm-hmm. the young, uh, millennial YouTube star. Oh yeah. He was great. Right. Was so That was so fun. And he talked about the, the benefits of artificial intelligence, intelligence being beneficial. Yeah. And but he he had to acknowledge the incredible encroachment that artificial intelligence is having both in our technology, in our personal lives. And then obviously, you know, if it if it affected an election or not, that, you know, that part of the world life. And so, you know, and that's a business. And those are those are coming down through businesses. You know, so when I think of businesses, I think of transparency. Who's transparent as a business? So as a personal consumer, I use non animal tested products. And then recently I was asked by a friend, I was telling my friend this and he was like, do you know if your dog's products are non-animal tested? And I'm just like, as a consumer, it's tiring um, to find answers for everything. Jackie, we've had that, there's this product for faces that uses bee venom. And that's, again, I had to reach out to the company, like, how do you get bee venom without killing the bees? You know, and they luckily, they were transparent. On a planet where they we're s- saying there's a shortage of yeah. bees. Like, yeah. I didn't know bee venom was a thing. Yeah. It, <laughs> it makes your lips get that, like, uh, Botoxy thing going. Oh. Okay. Yeah. I, but, but we, the, that's the company That's why I don't know why they're, okay, it makes sense now. Well, this isn't for the lips, this one. <laughs> I don't know if I have anything on my lips, but it, you know, they, they gratefully responded within 24 hours. They sent a video about what they do. They sent everything that's in it. So they were a transparent company, but most big companies are not transparent. That that's to me is what I worry about when it comes to businesses and consumers and, and where we're growing and how big this world is. Netflix has a documentary, to your point, Stephanie, that is a really good example of transparency. It's called The Inventor Out of Blood in Silicon Valley, which is about the business rise of Elizabeth Holmes, making her the youngest self-made billionaire and a woman, which turned out to be a scam essentially because she didn't have to provide transparency in the early, in the beginning stages of her business development. She raised uh, $400 million to start a business, she was a Stanford graduate dropout, 
And she had a board of directors that was like presidential, like literally United States presidential, to do this because what she was saying is you can take a drop of blood and run all of these tests. Yeah. Going back to Stephanie's point about transparency, what happened was that she really, you know, bilked everybody because there was no there there to her end game. But because she didn't have to be transparent about the process to anybody, it ran on for years until wow. they realized some there was no there. Some people got mm. sick and got hurt. And know. Walgreens invested a lot of money. You yeah. could go to Walgreens and get it. But that would, you'd go to Walgreens thinking you were going to get a prick, but they had to do IVU traditionally. So there was like... There was that going on, mm. and there was a lot of confusion in the marketplace. Yeah. And of course, nobody really wants to have a full IV withdrawn to have blood withdrawn as we currently do it. So it's kind of an example of what you're saying about the whole idea of the transparency. And, it's, and, it, and it, it can be scary. I think in in I hope that I'm not completely off base with this, but I do feel like I heard something where it was like even with the FDA, like they have a case needs to be brought up against something as hey, this may be unsafe. Go look into it. Versus having something where before a product can come out, it's like, all right, the FDA, food, you know, food. Uh, the drug administration, yeah. It has yeah. to make sure that it is effective and does exactly what it says. It's that, no, put it out there. And then if we end up having claims, then we can take it away. And it's like, I don't know. That, that seems kind of. Kind the of process scary. seems off. Kind yeah, of a little bit. bit. Yeah, and I would have just imagined. I just I have no experience, but I would just imagine that's the, actually as a government agency, it's just too small to keep up and test. Oh and yeah. Keep innovation back if it actually had to do, to do exactly. every, so, everything. Yeah, that's everything a good point. Everything is so so difficult. These are such tough know. questions. <laughs> well, I've got three very smart um, women who are uh, putting their foot out for it forward. And Amy Johnson, who is our uh, next guest, is a founder and integrator of the Amy Johnson company. And, you know, she's using the word integrator, which I think is really powerful. And I know when I started using the word TV guestpert, like the people were like, what? T- we still Someone corrected us once. It's guest expert. I was like, no, it's no, TV guest our company is TV <laughs> guest And so when I started you. the, you know, using that as, as vernacular for a guest expert on a show, which we're going to have guest experts on in a moment, at the time people were like, what is the, but now it's actually, we, we have it trademarked, but a lot of people use it. It's yeah. like become yeah. a common, it's become a common vernacular guest expert. So, you know, I do believe in, you know, taking a chance on, on branding and owning something that is literally an integration. So we're going to hear about that in a moment. So... We'll be right back. In our next podcast sequence, meet the behind the scenes women who are making positive impact through the business of business. Salesforce.com did do some research and 86% of customers or consumers care about a company's ethics. Even though we set off with good intentions, we don't always um, get the consequences or the outcomes that we, we expected. And my job is to be the mirror. And to reflect back. So I don't react. I'm in a neutral state of consciousness when I'm doing that reading and I'm just downloading the information. If you are doing extraordinary things from behind the scenes, from any walk of life, we'd love to hear from you. Subscribe to us on YouTube at TV Guestbert and or TV Guestbert Broadcast Podcast. Are you ready to take your seat front and center and need some behind the scenes media training? Sign up for our online course, Media Marketing. For more information, go to tvguestbert.com. Alex Detail was a child genius who saved the world from the evil harvesters. But a decade later, this mysterious alien force has returned, and Alex is no longer a prodigy. Now, in order to save the world again, he must survive his kidnapping, find his evil clone, and get his ship to the planet Pluto, where he will uncover the universe's ultimate power. Alex Details Revolution, a thrilling new novel by Darren Campo. Buy online or wherever books are sold. Welcome back to Front and Center with Jackie Jordan. The fashion industry is a huge industry. It's $3 trillion a year. It employs millions and millions of people. And it also is one of the most resource intense industries in the world. And most people don't know that. We're back with Front and Center, and we are the show talking to change agents and activators and taking her seat with us Front and Center today is my friend Amy Johnson of Amy Johnson Company, former film executive and now an integrator. So tell us, we, we, we just left talking about an integrator, but you're, you're owning that word as a business moniker, which I really love, as a title. Like chief inspirational officer we're seeing these days. Right, exactly. As an integrator, what does that mean to you? So for an integrator, what I've done is I work with businesses and individuals and influencers and help integrate their values, first to find the values, 
and clarify them and then integrate those values in all aspects of the business. So it gets really clear because it can be everything from company culture to policies to strategic partnerships to um, how you want to live your life. Because when we can come from our values, everything becomes much clearer, decisions get easier, and um, we get to be more productive and out there in the world. And um, and I th- it takes a holistic approach to business, which I believe is more 21st century than the past century. What are your observations between the 21st century corporate values and the current structures we are exiting? Good question. A lot of times people, when I say the word values, they gloss over. There right. becomes a thing like, what? <laughs> um, because we're not, we haven't been talking about it as much. But when you, when I start to kind of dial deep and um, ask people what they want to do, the conversation gets much more meaningful. And I've had a lot of fun. I work with Amber Valletta, who's an actress and a supermodel. And she came to me when she wanted something more than just acting and being a model and didn't know what she wanted to do. So we started to define her values. And in that process, it became very, very clear how much environmentalism and sustainability was important to her. So then we launched together two businesses for her in sustainable fashion. And, you know, in that work, she's built up her thought leadership. They became new revenue streams and doing great work out there. And And you're uh, kind of tackling the issue of sustainability within the fashion industry. Can you give us a more an example of how you're uh, provoking this disruption? Because it's a good example of how your business operates. The intent is to disrupt. So the fashion industry is a huge industry. It's three trillion dollars a year. It employs millions and millions of people. And. It also is one of the most resource intense industries in the world. And most people don't know that. People think they just want to go out and they, you know, fashion's also amazing. It's creative. What do we want to wear? How do I want to express myself? And we all wear clothes. So it's something that touches all of us. But we're making far more clothes than people need in, in their life. And people believe clothes are disposable and throwing them in the trash. But there's an enormous amount of waste in fashion. And, um, and there's also a lot of toxicity in the products that uses land and cotton, which is considered a natural plant, uses so much water to grow and it's heavy use of pesticides. So there's a lot of problems in fashion and you wouldn't know that. Have you, you ever thought about that, Phil? Never. Ever. Never yeah. once. No. Like you're saying it and I'm like what? I've never I'm thought like, about I've never that thought either. of where this t shirt came from. Right. Ever. I, ever. Right. It's so on the how rack. Long it took to me. You know, like so. fourteen ninety nine or lower, I'm in. But that was it. I mean, I might, I might have an idea about like, is it, is it American made or is it slave labor made? Right. That's probably the most, the farthest I've gone on a clothing question. Yes, and I mean, but this is to the point Stephanie was saying earlier about transparency because we're asking for more companies to be transparent about their supply chains because in fashion those supply chains are really, really long, and so things can be made from all over the world. And in fact, unfortunately, LA has some of the worst factories here. And I don't, I haven't gone a deep dive yeah, yeah. into that, but. There's more to be exposed there. And I hear that from the young fashion designers that I meet with with Amber locally, that they don't want to produce here because the risk of it not being, you know, well made here is a concern. Oh, that's interesting. So it's just interesting what we think of as the problem versus the problem. The only other big one we I'm we waiting for fur, fur to go away. Yeah, I don't want to like, see when a single celebrity fashion. in fur. Yeah. Stop it. 2019, yeah. 2020, 21, stop it. We talk about right. that one a yeah. lot. Yeah. One of the things that, and I don't know if this really ties in with what we were talking about earlier, but I, I'm very curious to see you talk about values mm-hmm. with corporations and how often are you finding, is there a conflict of the co- the corporation's values with the individuals inside of that corporation's values as an individual person? And how often do you notice that happening with some of the people you work with? Absolutely. I mean, I think within the industries, I mean, I'll start kind of broader first, which is, yeah, within the industry. So, you know, Amber deciding to do something different in there. I also work with a nurse practitioner who saw a problem in the health industry. So she still works as a nurse practitioner, but wants to, you know, do something called bridge gap in the medical field to help pregnant women go through, you know, a healthy prenatal where she, they get emotional support, not just going to check off a box of of a list of things. So within the industries, there are these gaps that are getting created. And then within the companies, I would say it's the same thing. I think the number is like less than 10% of the employees even know what the values are at a company. Mm -hmm. They're used to kind of being on the wall, not actually integrated. Yeah. Where we talk about operations, but we talk about growth and scale and profitability and all these things are great, but at what expense? And to your point earlier of the extremes, you know, the 
the 21st century thinking is, the, is that you can have profit and do well to the earth and do well to people. And it's called triple bottom line. Also, what I've heard more recently, and it's in the news, is employees standing up. And there was concern at different big companies all over um, this country in particular, where the, where the employees are voicing their concerns about behaviors. And Salesforce.com is a great example where the employees inside were angry and also out externally because their software was being used by ICE. And so they were not happy about that. When you say employees are speaking up, we spoke on a, another podcast episode about generational gaps. Is there, is you, why is that that you're seeing more vocalness necessarily? Is it because younger people are being more vocal? Absolutely. Yeah. The millennials uh, and Go Gen Z. <laughs> yeah. You know, Salesforce.com did do some research and 86 percent of customers or consumers care about a company's ethics. I mean, that's a huge number. It means it makes good business sense to think about your values. And in addition to that, you know, the, it's like 90% of millennials will pay attention to a company's sustainability or their transparency factor or as a product have, um, is it made from renewable resources? And there's, what's amazing is there are solutions for so many of the problems I that we have today. I always say the whole planet, everything could be, the solutions are available. The solutions are available. Yeah. It's that we, and, and I think the important thing is that we all recognize that we are making choices and voting with our dollars as much as we're voting hopefully voting um, in elections, <laughs> but all the time. And, and it is difficult because it is emailing and, you know, um, texting or tweeting CEOs and asking them about their companies, at, like exactly what you were talking about. There's no, that's how they know and get pressure to change. If there's no pressure to change, they will, the status quo will stay the same. And then the question is, yeah. you know, what happens to all then, of us? And then, yeah. and, right, like I think apathy can creep in and people just yeah. like, look, I just want to go to work. I don't want to get my paycheck and I don't want to worry about it, you know? Or, right. Or like you said, with like the mission, you know, the, what are the values and who's holding each other accountable? I mean, I think even um, I, I remember reading like Enron's, Enron's motto was like respect, integrity, uh, communication and excellence. Right. But it's like, who are the people that are holding each other accountable and I guess right. it is we're, we're, we're entering a new place in business where it's no longer just this from the top trickle down. Like there is because of social media, a little bit of this platform for people at all aspects to have their ability to speak up. The media used to play a role in exposing the injustices of businesses. Now it's kind of, you know, because we have social media, it's kind of sometimes tearing from the inside out. But you talk about the disconnection. Yes. I mean, it, I talk a lot about connecting the disconnect. I think people feel the disconnect more than they even understand where it's coming from. And part of why integration is so key is because that helps realign what's happening. And yeah, get, get it off the wall because it doesn't really mean anything up there if it's not if there's no kind of moral compass to it. And yeah. the the UN um, in 2015 came out with uh, 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which is basically the idea that you can have profit, you can also have inclusion and social fairness, as well as take care of the planet. So that idea of triple bottom line. And if we can use those as guideposts of how to go forward then it makes a lot more sense and a lot more, and we'll have a planet actually to give to yeah. our children. The, and the tough thing is, is but then how, how do you deal with someone that is like, you know what? No, like I want to make my money right. and I'm not worried about <clears throat> like, I'm not going to do anything to dis like to make it terrible, but I'm not, no, I don't want to, I don't want feel a social pull to go out right. and do these things. And I guess then that's where the power of the consumer comes in, I guess. The voting with the dollars and the, the pressure. The I mean, I you know, there are companies still pumping a bunch of CO2 out in the world. And we know how dangerous that is. I even think with the plastic bottle companies, the yeah. LA Times just did a story that uh, the whole recyclable market has gone down. People right. aren't paying attention or they don't want to pay the elevation and price to have recyclable products that are made from plastic. So now we... We're back to plastic again. But I've always simply felt just hold the water companies responsible for their own cleanup, period. Right. You know, or we then will all just pick up our own water bottles and fill them ourselves. Like, to me, it's a very simple, It's to me, it's very simple and cut and dry. But but who makes that rule, you know, and it, who it, you know, is, is it? Is and it who enforces local it? Who enforces it? Yeah, well, and so a, really we have to take the, as a consumers, as customers, we have to take our power. Well, as a consumer, though, at the same time, is there's times where you may be stuck where, like, um, 
you're trying to think of a quick example shoes we'll say like people are like i know some vegans who also don't wear like like leather and sometimes you run out of if you can't like we live in los angeles how do you live without a car but you know you can't necessarily afford a tesla or something so right. you, like there's a also catch 22 is how do i help but i still feel pigeonholed at certain times to use a plastic water bottle or i have to get right. gas in my or, car to get do, you know and here do you have to be all in 100 percent completely yeah, I don't think or you are I don't you think or because i think then it opens up the door for people that want to be anti the change it's like oh well you're just a hypocrite and and i think that sometimes that that black and white that all or nothing we can kind of could get really militant about exactly. and then it's yeah. not absolutely because it's, 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 it's a great point it's not possible to be mm-hmm. in los angeles without and that. that's why it's important to have like valued influencers like amber speaking out because she does walk that line between it takes courage to stand up and say, mm-hmm. I'm going to do something about fashion sustainability and not fashion sustainability and not do it 100 percent all the time. It's just moving the needle. And we really caution against perfectionistic paralysis for both the companies and as individuals. Well, so I that think you don't do n- yeah. nothing. Yeah. yeah. Progress rather yeah. than perfection. Yeah. Exactly. And then sometimes exactly. some people have to be the polarity integrator. Right. On something, you know, PETA yep. takes the polarity integration yeah. stance on animals. But if they weren't so extreme in the rescue space, then the middle, middle ground. ground would not really have done so well. Like they've taken taken such an extreme. That's really yeah. Right. You yeah. know. Yeah. But it's but it's thank goodness in a weird way that they've held that bizarre position mm-hmm. because now. We're all aware and all of the in-between rescues have really been able to balance out and bring a lot of animal awareness to the whole violations of neglect mm-hmm. and abandonment and abuse we have here right. on the animals. And, and I think to get back to saying, too, why we all as individuals or business owners, really it's important to be clear about our own values and start there because it's not an easy thing to do. I mean, I think we've established that, whether you're a small company, an individual, or a big company. But when we're clear, when we take the time to make those, you know, make those values clear and then uh, and integrate them into how we live our lives, then we have something on which to grow. Well, I, I I would love this for someone that's like for someone that's you know hearing this and watching this mm-hmm. and hearing you and they're and they look at their own lives and they go, you know what, actually, I I don't know what my values are. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I've ever really sat and thought about that. What is an exercise that somebody could do at home to really right. start to, to get this figured out for themselves? Or questions they can ask. They can ask themselves, um, what matters to me? You know, and just write down 10 things or 20 things and then circle the ones that are similar and just dial down. And then also start looking out at the world. There are companies that have great values out there. And there's a lot of conversation about values that is happening and and start researching who has values that align with what I believe in and then start buying from those companies, supporting those companies too. So, but the, really just sitting down, it, values are what matters to me and what do I, how do I want to be and, inter, and interact with the world around me? So starting with that and then really asking, once you have your list, it's really great to say, how do these exist? How do these op, like look like in my life today? And how can they look in my life today? So there's a process to go through that I do with small groups or individuals that's really helpful. But it's just really a simple question. And it's an and doing it with an inquiry, not like there's a someone really who knows the right answer sitting above you and judging you for you saying like play is a value of mine. No, play is awesome. If we don't play what you know, that's where so much creativity comes from. So it's really getting rid of the critic and the the judgment and allowing the process to Un- unfold. Amy, we're as we're an inspirational show on Front mm-hmm. and Center. We like to share inspiring messages and photos mm. and we call it a, a photo spire. Is oh, there okay. a <laughs> uh. yeah. is there a particular photo um you maybe you've taken and shared or perhaps seen on social media that ha- is like your photo spire in the last 30 days that you can share with us? It's my daughter's in the backyard of my house that I took oh. earlier this summer. And I want to post that because it's just a moment in time with them. They're 14 and 16, and it is about them. And there's a Native American saying that we did not inherit the this planet, this earth, from our ancestors. We're borrowing it from our children. And when I think about my children, that is part of my own personal inspiration. 
Well, thank you so much for being an integrator, Amy Johnson of Amy Johnson and Company, and we will be right back. If you could activate big business with consciousness, what changes would you like to see happen? Find out what these powerhouses have to say. The number I heard recently was that 80% of all new small businesses are started by women. Mm -hmm. I am just kind of creating a container to your inner genius. If you are doing extraordinary things from behind the scenes, from any walk of life, we'd love to hear from you. Send us a note on our website, frontandcenterpodcast.com. If you're ready to write that book you've been putting off, join us at gespertpublishing.com for a how-to step-by-step online course that shares your publishing options and paces you on how to structure your book. Alex Detail was a child genius who saved the world from the evil harvesters. But a decade later, this mysterious alien force has returned and Alex is no longer a prodigy. Now, in order to save the world again, he must survive his kidnapping, find his evil clone, and get his ship to the planet Pluto, where he will uncover the universe's ultimate power. Alex Details Revolution, a thrilling new novel by Darren Campo. Buy online or wherever books are sold. Welcome back to Front and Center with Jackie Jordan. Do as you say you will do. And so when you look at what people say they value as organizations, I hear so many organizations say that they value diversity, and yet um, people can't fix what they don't know is broken. Welcome back to Front and Center. I'm Jackie Jordan. We are the show where we talk with the change agents, the storytellers, and the activators. And joining me is Stephanie Cobian, show producer, and Phil Barb, co-host. Thank you so much. And thanks to, shout out to Heather's Flowers for for providing such pretty flowers in our studio today. Okay, so my high school friend, <laughs> doctor, Lisa Mason Butel is here and she is joining in on this conversation that we're having about consciousness changing business and where we all fit into it. And I just wanna say you've had 18 years of working in leadership development and executive education. You would think that um, some of these companies would be making tremendous strides in gender equality and diversity, particularly by focusing on hiring more women leaders and executive ranks. Just wanted to talk to you. First off, it's just so funny to reconnect with you from high school. I know, right? You've, you've been very busy. As have you. Look yeah. at you now, right? If they had only known. <laughs> yeah, we could tell stories. <laughs> So tell us where you have traveled professionally and what you've seen in the area of leadership with your given background. So a lot of the work that I do is both executive coaching as well as leadership development and organizational development um, consulting as well. So on an average year, I work with about 60 different companies, um, nonprofit agencies, government agencies, um, educational organizations, and others to kind of help them decide what are the most important issues for that organization regarding their talent and their, their leadership and their leadership development, and then try to help them identify you know, how they best develop their people uh, moving forward so that they can continue to grow their businesses. So how do you direct them to grow their business? It could be anything from um, interventional, you know, helping people to... There's your intervention, Phil Barb. Right. I'm, you, I'm, you said it. it was going to be waiting, an intervention I'm waiting today. for it. I'm waiting for it. That's really the reason why they brought me here. They didn't want to tell you. Oh, my goodness. Just one after another. Just the tears. I told you I needed a good cry at some point. <laughs> Whether um, just helping to develop their people, regardless of what that looks like. So it could be as simple as teaching managers new skills, you know, how to better lead their people, how to hold people accountable, um, how to, uh, you know, identify their values, their mission. Yeah. And so, you know, helping people, helping organizations and leaders perform at their best. Obviously, my pack here comes from the entertainment industry. You come from sports and academia. Can you tell us what strides have been made in both of those arenas? Well, I look at both, um, you know, the 10 years that I spent working in in sports and then the number of years that I worked in um, higher education as being very similar to what a lot of corporations do in that, you know, um, we have a saying that common sense doesn't always make common practice. And so what I've seen Stephanie is... Stephanie has an expression that... Oh, yeah. Me and some other team members are always like, my common sense is not your common sense. I'm like, what do you mean? I don't understand, but... Well, and I think a lot of times, both individuals and organizations, we start off having the best of intentions, right? And so we might make a decision to, um, 
you know, establish a certain role. So there's a, a position that the NCAA uh, required universities to have starting in the late 80s. It was a senior women administrator position, um, for example, which was great. And, and, and it started off by requiring that every university athletic department have at least one senior woman on their administrative team. But what's happened in some cases, not all, but in some cases is that's limited people to having just one. And so, uh, you know, I, I think right, that's it, it almost creates the, it, it almost creates a, a different problem than the one it's trying to solve. Exactly. It, or reinforcing the same problem it's trying to solve. It's right. like a check. You just check the box yes. and then you can move on. And you can move on, but nothing that. really changed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and early on in my career in, in athletics, there were four young women um, that worked on our on our in our athletic department. And when the woman who was our designated senior woman administrator was retiring, I remember one of my colleagues say to me, well, you know, only one of us can get that job. And it just struck me as odd that, you know, our male colleagues didn't have to have the same conversation. conversation. And yet what's frightening is, you know, this many years later, 20 years later, that's still the case in many organizations. So even though we set off with good intentions, we don't always... Um, get the consequences or the outcomes that we we expected. It's that kind of that idea that you can't, um, you, you know, you can't change this. You can't change the problem with the same mindset that you created the problem. Right. You know, and it's kind of like, oh, we check the box. Mm-hmm. OK, we can move on back to what we were doing. <laughs> but here we go. Same with academia, which you would expect as a more progressive, you know, you would expect the educational system to be more pro- progressive in uh, roles. What was your experience with that? It's interesting that, again, having been on the inside of the ivory tower, um, it's education is not what I would describe as a necessarily a, a progressive organization. You know, in fact, there's a lot of the reward system that are built in to um, maintain and reward the status quo, right? Um, and so, you know, whether it's the way that the organization, and I see this a lot with my clients that work in healthcare. Um, or work in R and D or science, science and engineering. They'll they'll take their best um, th- their best academics. Now these are people who have incredible amount of competence, right? And so much of their identity is tied up into how much they know. But put them in positions where they've had no experience and no exposure. So you see that in um, healthcare organizations taking physicians and putting them into management roles. Incredibly competent people um, with. Uh, and incredibly intelligent, but have never had any type of real management experience or management training. And yet we expect those people to flourish. And so you see that in, you know, in, in technology, you may take your best computer scientist or you may take your best engineer and then put them in a management position. Again, incredibly talented, competent people, but have never been trained how to lead or manage people before. So it's kind of a recipe for disaster when you look at it that way. <laughs> and this is kind of what pers- had you pursue your doctorate. It is. Well, that and, um, again, having had the experience that I had in athletics, uh, when I was working in executive education, I can recall like the moment specifically, I was with, uh, I was in, an, in an, uh, a classroom during an executive program with uh, a guy named Ram Charan, who's one of the world's greatest strategists. And um, I looked around the room, and I, I have a, a friend of mine who we're still friends to this day, and we were sort of like the trouble – um, students sitting in the back of a class. I didn't and know you that way, at least. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm Ever. trying not to look at you because I'm pretty sure that you and I sat in the back of the class on more than one occasion <laughs> as well. Um, but so this friend of mine, she was a banking executive, and uh, I remember sitting in this class with her. There were 56 people in the room, and there were eight of us were women. And I remember just thinking, like, so it, it just struck me that this was a topic on strategy, whereas many of the other programs that we had were you know focused on on more on leadership or dealing with people or communications or otherwise, but this topic on strategy tended to draw a largely male audience. And looking around the room, thinking again, this is a pretty business centric topic. Um, that if there's only and I worked there, so there were only seven other there were only seven women in that room. I'm thinking we have a problem here, and so that's why I did. I decided to pursue my PhD so that I could really take a look into what are some of the similarities and differences between. Um, men and women in the executive roles. That's interesting you say that because I'm part of a, an executive coaching group. Um, you have to financially qualify, and I'm the smallest business in the group, which is great because I'm amongst businesses that can you know pull up. But of that, it's six business owners are women, and 22 business owners are men. And in one of our recent um, days that we spent together. It, one of the stats that uh, was pulled up was of all the women business owners, like only 2% are, over, are making over a million dollars a year. 
So even though women are flourishing with starting home businesses, mompreneurs, the internet has given accessibility, there's, there is still not an economic uh, uh, reward or that women have tapped into in terms of owning their own businesses, which I still find just fascinating to look at because I think the assumption is that women business owners are doing much better and are much stronger than they actually really are. And there's a lot of layers to that. It's not, that's just not one, you know, I'm not calling out one layer to that. I think there's a lot of dynamics in that. Is it, but it but it kind of plays right back into the so I'm I'm acknowledging it from being outside of a corporate organizational structure and saying you know there's still a, at least a discrepancy in in earnings or income even in the on the small business level of things and so again when I was doing uh, research in this topic what I found was that I, I used a leadership assessment and what I found was um, that only there was only one area out of thirty where women and men were significantly different at the executive level. Um, when I also looked at that information between manager, women managers and women executives, that number was um, dramatically different. So there were more, more differences with um, male and female managers than there were at the executive levels, which suggests that you know, the women that advance are the ones who tend to behave just like their male colleagues, right? Yes. right? I mean, so there's a, certain there's a certain expectation of how people behave at, at the executive level. And so some people are equipped to... Um, operate that way and some people maybe not so much right so I think that's where you see uh, the number I heard recently was that 80% of all new small businesses are started by women and yes. so that's where I think you see a lot of women feel like they're not living up to their values um, their organization may not be and therefore they they leave and they start something I think it's very true for the entertainment industry I think it's very <laughs> tr true for women of a certain age within a, the entertainment industry and what I can also say, at least in my own observation of being in this executive coaching um, group with these other business owners, was where is that the men have no trouble making money. Like, the money is the easy part. What they don't have a handle on is time and priorities. Whereas the small group of women, we can multitask time. Like, that's just, but we can't tap the same amount of um, income. What do you mean by the priorities? They're usually workaholics or they're too involved in their business or they're, they're, they want to spend more time with their family or with, when they're with their family or they're, they're, they got their head in their business anyway, so they're not really present for the family. Whereas the women in the group, that doesn't seem to be a problem. So I worked for a retired CEO for eight years, and um, he used to say that you could have, that any executive or CEO could have... Um, you could have a work life, of, out of a work life, a family life, or a social life. At any point in time, you could have two out of the three. And so you think about that. You know, when you have children, you know, you're giving up your social life. Absolutely. When they get older, maybe you're giving up your family life. Or, you know, depending on where people are in terms of their careers. Um, Age. And their priorities, right? And, yeah. you know, that's where. So I, I think that that example is probably pretty telling and maybe explains why some of the people that you've encountered yeah. aren't as happy as they yeah, uh, should be. as they should be, yeah. given yeah. the amount of success that they've had. Right, exactly, exactly. Because everybody thinks if you're a business owner, you can take off work anytime you want. <laughs> and, and what if there's something to be said? And I, like, I'm sure there's gotta, if there, there's gotta be a lot of people that would much rather spend that time with family. And then I gotta assume there's gotta be people on the flip side that would much rather make money. I, that, I you know, that. like, and I think it's, and it's personal, obviously, yeah, what, like it, your, and it's, what your priority it's, is. Yeah. I think a lot of times it's like, we try to understand how it would be for everyone, but I guess maybe it is different for everyone. And Lisa, um, you've also dealt with the diversity as an issue. You've dealt with gender in the organizational structure and diversity. What changes are you seeing with diversity? Oh, that's such an interesting question, given the political climate and the world that we're living in Sensitive today. Sensitive question, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, again, it's, um, do as you say you will do. And so when you look at what people say they value as organizations, I hear so many organizations say that they value diversity, and yet um, people can't fix what they don't know is broken. And there's, I think at times, people who are very much well-intentioned, but don't have an idea or don't have the amount of self-awareness that they need in order to understand that the things that they do may not necessarily be um, as inclusive to diverse populations um, as they think that it should be, right. you know? I, I wish there was a little bit, I think there's sometimes where it's like, we just, I wish as a whole, right, I'm generalizing for everyone, but I wish we could just be a little bit more open with saying like, hey, I don't have the answer. 
and I actually don't know enough about this thing to speak intelligently about it. Um, or like maybe before, like I wish I joke with, with friends sometimes. I wish there was like a 30 minute window before you were going to have any type of discussion politically, race based, uh, a- anything, anything that's a sensitive, like for the first 30 minutes, no one is allowed to have a side. Let's just put everything in the table. Let's throw out ideas. Let's look at it from this angle. Look at it from this angle. Someone else's perspective before we start putting labels on what's right and wrong in your side, my side. Because I think a lot of times people genuinely don't know. You know, I think you look at, you know, from a diversity standpoint, and I don't know if this, I'm going to maybe be a little off on the statistic, but there's something like in America, like 65% of uh, white Americans run in white only circles and they don't have a diverse life. And, and then the, you know, and so you look at people that don't have access. And so, but instead of saying like, I actually don't know, I don't know. I want to how- call that a gated community, but I don't know if that's a bad <laughs> joke or not. You know, <laughs> you know but it's like, we have people where we do have those times where it, I, I wish like, it's okay to not know how you feel about something. And it's okay to say, I don't know. I like that though. And I it's think okay it's to have say, a I don't know. I don't have a solution. I don't know. But yes. Yeah. But I'm willing. I'm willing like, let's have a discussion. A yeah. Let's be like, we talk. So, I mean, willingness to address, like, I'm willing to like, let's have a discussion. Let's yep. talk about this. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to, I want to know what I don't know. I'll doesn't that go it. back to the same thing we were talking about earlier as far as authenticity goes? Yep. You know, if you have a genuine curiosity about mm-hmm. other people, other issues, you're going to be able to be in a position to where you're much more open-minded in asking questions. Um, unfortunately, I don't think a lot of people really are. Well, and, and you don't have to be, you know, I think it, it then a lot of time, I, I don't know. I think there's a lot of part of us that goes back to like the little kid that raised his hand and we didn't, and then we got the answer wrong and we got ridiculed where yeah. we all feel that we have to have the right answer. We have to have an answer. And if we don't have an opinion, it means we're uneducated or it means that, you know, we don't care. And I think there are some times where it's just like, hey, man, I just... I don't know how I feel about that and then go from there to try to like tackle some of these very difficult issues rather than feeling like I am this type of a person. This is my identity. This is who I need to This is what my stance has to be. Like, I don't know, man. I'm just some dude trying to figure it out. (laughs) I don't know. Yeah, you know? well, that goes into, Phil, the, the saying, um, what's the saying, Jackie, that if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem, which isn't always true. It can Living. be true, but it isn't always true. Right. I think that I think becomes, that's a big I think deal. We talk, that becomes the scapegoat of like the 100, per, you're either this or you're, yeah, that, you're either that, right? Yeah. Like, oh, well, if you're not, if you're not, uh, if you, you don't, don't believe what it. I believe, yeah, then you are my enemy. And therefore, since you are my enemy, you are against my cause. When I was like, yo, man, I just, I just want to have a conversation. Yeah, Absolutely. but I think the approach that you're talking about to me is so refreshing because that is somebody you're genuinely curious about others and um, versus trying to sell your opinion or your perspective to so many other people. And God, how much world, how much different would the world be if we all yeah. tended to approach one another that way? I just always look at it like I'm 33. There it is. It's out there. <laughs> I admit it to it. I admit it. I, I've made so many mistakes and been wrong so many times at 25 and at 27 and at 28. And at 17, that it would be ridiculous of me to think that I'm not going to be wrong at 33. And not even the same person is the other thing. Yeah. Like, I'm not even the same person. We're not the same people. So, we knew each other. So if, right. Yeah. So if I can look at my past and know that I've been wrong many times before, like, I'm going to be wrong many times in the yeah. future. So I actually don't have to have any judgment about, like, me having all the answers because, like, I'm going to be wrong a lot of the time. And I'm cool with that. So as somebody who tends to look at the world through the lens of leadership, like I'm just finding this conversation so refreshing because I do think that, you know, having that amount of self-awareness is half the battle, right? I mean, you know, you can't be something that you're not, um, but you also can't. Um, so, you, so you have to know who you are, right? Mm-hmm. And then and go from there. And so, um, yeah, I, I'm just I'm, I'm loving the conversation that we're having because so much of what you're talking about is leadership, right? So you're not having feeling as though you need to be right or need to be wrong. Somebody who's willing to be to be wrong and acknowledging that, you know, hey, I'm human. This is what I am. Reminds me of a, um, a professor I had in my doctoral program who um, was very intimidating and would threaten you by um, by suggesting that she would give you a B. And I got to the point finally with her where um, I said, I'll take the B. Right. I mean, so, you know, like, just give me the B and then we can have a genuine, authentic conversation. And, you know, that was like acknowledging that I'm human and I fail. And um, so for me, I, I had such a better experience from 
from that point forward than if I had just, you know, tried to meet their expectations yeah. by always pursuing the A. I mean, I can pursue that, but I'm fine without it. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you for joining us on your show. Oh, Our thank show. You. Thank you. <laughs> when you know you deserve something, you no longer have to pursue it because it will pursue you. Follow us on Instagram or Facebook at TV Gusper. Alex Detail was a child genius who saved the world from the evil harvesters. But a decade later, this mysterious alien force has returned and Alex is no longer a prodigy. Now, in order to save the world again, he must survive his kidnapping, fight his evil clone, and get his ship to the planet Pluto, where he will uncover the universe's ultimate power. Alex Details Revolution, a thrilling new novel by Darren Campo. Buy online or wherever books are sold. Welcome back to Front and Center with Jackie Jordan. If you're coming to me, you're already open to this experience. It's it's not for everyone, and I'm not looking to work with everyone. But it, I absolutely think it's necessary and amazing work. And I'm, we're all intuitive, so we can really all do this. I'm just dedicated to doing it and, and, and live it. Hi, this is Front Center, and I am Jackie Jordan. And I'm joined here with Stephanie Kobe and our show producer and co-host, Philip Andrew Barb. And if you haven't heard me say this before, I've got a friend here. <laughs> Monique Evans is joining us. And we've been having this conversation about consciousness and business. And I've always said, if you want to change the business, you change the business owner. And Monique actually does that. She works one-on-one -on -one with business owners and changing them. And she has a background of 20 years in corporate America. So just give us the compare and despair between corporate America and then working with the entrepreneur and the business owners these days. Oh, it's so interesting. Well, Working in corporate America, people are, you know, they're being told what to do and they have a very specific job that they're res responsible for. And the entrepreneurs are responsible for everything. And a lot of entrepreneurs aren't used to managing everything. And so there's just a, it, all of their nuances come out in entrepreneurism. So it takes a, it takes a strong spirit to, to move forward. So you you're working with businesses and, and then they when they do have um, resistance uh, and another show we've actually talked about, like you're working with a lot of egos because if you work with smaller businesses, especially you're dealing with personal people. Mm -hmm. How do you navigate with the relationships, you know, with these people and their businesses, which can be their babies? Sometimes right. you can't separate the business from the person. I think that if you're showing up for the session, I, I do explain how it works. And I think that just explaining how it works helps take people a little bit off of that defensive edge. But when we're in it, if they're hearing things that they don't like, they I I welcome them to share it because that's your truth. That's being authentic. And I can only help you when you're in that state. So it's not, it's, it's welcoming whatever shows up. I think it's, it, you know, the, you know, doing the coaching and it's so important, mm -hmm. you know? And I was like, I always, I always kind of, I think we were talking earlier about like, you know, even Tiger Woods yeah. has a swing coach, mm -hmm. like, you know, like right? he can, know. he can only see the ball in the club from one angle. Right. And it's like, so having someone that can come in, ask the right questions, provoke the right type of, um, you know, answers and insight, it's so valuable. But I think you touched on a little bit, like, you know, it's, you have people come in you and they're already kind of there. Mm -hmm. And it's like, but that it's so interesting how that resistance, mm -hmm. even to like, who's going to, who, who are you to help me with my, I know my stuff. Like, Monique, I'm, I'm not being resistant. I'm not being I'm resistant. Not, no, I'm going to tell you I'm not being you know? resistant. Yeah. <laughs> And it's, uh, you know, I always, I always kind of love that, the question of like, you know, what are you, what are you pretending not to know? Oh, I love that. Mm. That is so good. You know, and I exactly. try to ask myself that. Like, yeah. all right, I what, ask yeah. myself it this way. If you did know the answer, Jackie, what would, what it, would it be? I love that one. There you go. I, I, that's, I mean, yeah. that's such a beautiful I one. Like, one. <laughs> I use that, like, yeah, I yeah. never, I refuse to accept, I don't know. So good. Which is weird because the last time I just said I will, like, hey, I don't know, but it's, <laughs> but it's like asking that. Was like, well, what could it be? Not needing to have yeah. an answer, not needing to have an answer for the sake of just having an answer, but for the process of the thought. Yeah. You know, like it's that. allowing yourself exactly. to know. It's it's really giving yourself permission to have per all yeah. those answers because you do. They're all inside of us. Everything is here. A lot of people think that intuition is separate from running a business, but I run my business a lot on intuition. That's where I get my pitches from my ideas from my creative inspiration from you know and it's not like I'm I have to sit behind my desk at that moment and behind a computer find a solution but if I have the channel clear 
you know, it comes in. I'm like, oh, that's what I need to do. Or, you know, or the intuitive thought of, oh, this is who I need to call. I mean, and sometimes, and then because that is so fine tuned, I can be like lightning, yep. you know, yep. making things happen just because, you as know. As long as you're taking that action. Because it's oh, one course. thing to have the intuition, but it's the other thing to take the action. Well, it got too painful for me not to take the action. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the missing there. the opportunity <laughs> because I thought it in the shower and I just didn't pick up the phone. Mm. I can't, I, that is way too, too painful to, to, well, to do I think, and you use a, a perfect word, right? Opportunity. Like when you tr- retrain yourself to see resources, opportunity, and possibilities in mm. every single situation. Even the yeah. negative ones, or the ones that you think aren't going your way or yeah. if there when, is no negative. When you but, know that there's always a way like when you actually just just own that, I think it's like, you know, there's so many different theories on like gamifying your life and making things more of a game and just mm-hmm. fun. And it's like you just start to be like, oh, cool opportunity. Here we go. We'll try this. We'll do this. Did it work? It no. Worked. OK. Did it, did, or maybe it did. Awesome. But great. you're not attached. So you don't have you're that atta- resistance. You're not you attached. You kind of let go of that resistance. Exactly. Yeah. 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 One of my things that I always tell Jackie is um, not necessarily the intuition end, but mine is always trust your gut. Mm-hmm. So people who don't necessarily have an intuition about things or foresight is one of the first things I think where to start is listen to your gut. When I do not listen to my gut, it always it always comes back to me. Guess what? That's your intuition. Always. Right. But, I, <laughs> not, on a, but not on a larger <laughs> scale yet. Right. Like my I mother. I'm not yeah. seeing things. Who to call it yet. But, yeah. that, but that's what I'm saying for, for people who are listening that it's about if you're not on the intuitive level yet that is to know who to reach out to. Know that it like following things. It is to start by listening to your gut. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously going to somebody, the openness to other things, but it's, it's listen to your gut. Yeah. Listen to your gut. And oftentimes the work that I'm doing, I'm actually validating what people already know. So, I mean, yes, there's some golden nuggets in there that are new and we explore and extrapolate from. But oftentimes, like, I knew that. I hear that often. I'm like, this is the validation. Here's the validation to your... Mm-hmm. I am just kind of creating a container to your inner genius. I'm just reflecting a that mirror. back. A mirror. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today on Front and Center. And if you've missed some of our other series, you can find us at frontandcenterpodcast.com. We've got more interviews to share with you. Thank you so much for joining us on the Front and Center with Jackie Jordan podcast. Please subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on Instagram at TV Guestbert. We'd love to hear from you. Are you ready to take your seat front and center and need some behind-the-scenes media training? Sign up for our online course, Media Marketing. For more information, go to tvguestbert.com. If you're ready to write that book you've been putting off, join us at guestbertpublishing.com for a how-to step-by-step online course that shares your publishing options and paces you on how to structure your book.